Welcome back, everybody. Super excited to be joined by Jay. And Jay, thank you so much for taking the time. Absolutely. Glad to be on your show. I've, I've enjoyed looking at some of your recent episodes. Awesome. Can you give people a quick introduction where you are sitting right now, what you do with your PhD, and also the fact that you're analyzing shipping? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Chris. So I'm actually in South Boston right now. Uh, I'm attending Harvard University for three years as, as part of a PhD fellowship program. Um, as part of this program, I'm studying international relations, uh, specifically the overlap between international trade and security policies. So it, it kind of blends a little bit into the shipping research I do. So that's kind of fun and to be able to do that. But as far as my shipping research, that's been a long time hobby of mine, really, for more than a decade now. Uh, back in 2015, we actually established Value Investors Edge as a more formal business. We, we went ahead and kicked that off. And that was, wow, that's, yeah, we're coming up on six years. It was actually uh, late April 2015. So it'll be the six year anniversary here in about two weeks. Um, so we just kicked that off as a research service to formalize a little bit more of what I was doing already on, on Seeking Alpha. And as part of that, you know, over the years, we've built up our team. Uh, we have a lead macro guy, James Catlin, which I'm sure most folks are familiar with on, on Seeking Alpha. We, we have an energy guy that does that full time. We hired someone that just works on our analytics platform and, and makes that thing pretty awesome. He has a lot of coding skills that I can't even figure out, but it's nice. And we, we just hired another analyst last year that's doing a fantastic job for us in shipping. So yeah, we have, we have quite the team, right? It's not just me. We, we have a team of five of us now and uh, pretty excited to just be part of these markets. But, but how early did you discover that passion for international trade? Because I guess that was from an early age that you kind of, you loved looking into that, the trains and the trading overseas, etc. Yeah, I think always, even as even as like a little kid, you know, I, I grew up in a, in a smaller town in Arizona and we had, you know, railroad tracks like most people do that are close to the town. And every 30, 40 minutes, you know, there'd be a train with 50, 80, 100 uh, boxes, containers on it. And, you know, you always sit there as a little kid and you're, you know, I don't know, eight years old, but you're, you're kind of daydreaming about where those containers are going and what's inside of them. And like, you know, sometimes it's like, you know, a clear one that has like cars on it. So you know what it is, but a lot of times it's the, you know, the orange or green box or whatever. So you can kind of think about how the world works. So I think, I think that was as a young age, I was interested in that. And then as I started my undergrad, I, I studied economics and that's when it became a little bit more formalized, right? I started learning about, you know, actually the models of how international trade works, how these things apply. Uh, that was, I, I started college right around the, uh, the global financial crisis. So that was a huge shakeup, right, of trade. Um, and being able to see, you know, the surging flows from Asia continued, but seeing kind of the Western Europe and, and United States go through a lot of financial shakeup was was also kind of motivating. Like, why did that happen? How did that work? So, so that's, I guess, more of a formal, sort of a sort of a fun background as a little kid, and then more of a formalized educational background as well. Do you remember sort of the first analysis you did? What kind of companies it was, or? What oh man, shipping? Uh, but it was it was probably pretty garbage. So if anyone sees it, I hope they don't take it too seriously. I, I think it was uh, my first Seeking Alpha report was in 2011. And I'd been on Seeking Alpha for a little bit over a year, probably a year and a half as part of the community and, you know, reading articles and, and doing comments and stuff. And I said, you know, I might as well do, you know, a blog article or something. I think I did like Microsoft or something. Uh, it was probably pretty terrible. Um, and then I think my first shipping stock, I I think it might have been dry ships. <laughs> Gosh, I, I don't know, man. If it was 2011 or 2012 uh, and you go back and read one of those articles I wrote, uh, please forgive me. It was probably pretty pretty terrible. No, but I mean, everything is about the progress. Can you just give a bit of an introduction to Seeking Alpha as well for those people that aren't familiar as well? Yeah, absolutely. So Seeking Alpha, at least their model or, or their goal is to kind of open source uh, investment research and sort of build a community around that. So uh, Motley Fool was kind of, I guess, the first pioneer of the space back in like 97, 98, 99. And then Seeking Alpha came out in the mid 2000s. And Seeking Alpha was a little bit more, I would say, well, two things. First of all, they were very community oriented. They had a lot of active comments. Like a lot of times when you read these articles on Seeking Alpha, you'll get a lot more out of the comments and the debate about the article, not even so much the article. So that's that's one strength of Seeking Alpha. And then the other strength is they have a full team of professional editors. And, and actually, they, their, their senior editors are all CFAs. Like these guys are, are financial wizards. So, you, you know, you can't sneak a lot of... If you're trying to write a professional article on Seeking Alpha, you can get a lot of good mentorship and a lot of good coaching from both the editors and the readers. Now, I know there's people that say uh, there's all sorts of garbage on Seeking Alpha, and that might be true. There is some clickbait out there, but for the most part, 
I mean, for what you're getting, open source, like investment research, I, it's pretty good stuff. Definitely. So, so there's a good reason to be on it. Uh, you have so many great ideas in shipping. I, I want to start with, with the first one being uh, the idea of the deep value investing. And maybe we can pair that up to the normal narrative about value investing. That is finding companies with a big moat, with a pricing power that you can stay in for 10, 15 years. Because that isn't necessarily the idea when you look at value in shipping, right? It's kind of a different... Wait. Yeah, I think I think for the most part you're right. It's these are not uh, Warren Buffett type companies. Uh, let's just be honest about that. Uh, if anything, there's probably a little bit more in common with something like a Ben Graham cigar butt. If you're using that sort of analogy, um, deep value is usually something that the there, there's value there on the balance sheet, right? There's a positive net asset value. That it's very cheap in terms of forward enterprise value to EBITDA or something like that. But there's probably something kind of wrong with the company, or there's something pressuring it. There's maybe some really bad perceptions or industry headwinds that are allowing you to get in for a ridiculous price, and and so a lot of you don't you don't have a lot of times where there's a deep value company that doesn't have wards. You have to understand there's maybe there's uh, concerns about next year's trade volumes, or maybe there's some management and governance concerns, and you have to look at those and balance those out on a risk reward basis. And we've done that for many years. And, and in fact, formally, I told you we launched Value Investors Edge in the middle of 2015. Uh, we started formally tracking our picks and our trades and all that sort of thing in 2016. So that was our first full year. And for six out of six years, we've been able to beat the shipping average handily, which shipping average has been pretty bad. So and that's, that's maybe that alone isn't that great. But out of five of six of those years, we've been able to beat the Russell, which is something I'm really proud of because the Russell is all small caps. And we're focused exclusively on shipping, which has been challenged. And we've been able to you know, beat the Russell five out of six years. And I think that just speaks to our team's abilities. And like, I couldn't do it without my macro guy, for example. And he, like, he lays the table macro-wise, like which industries have the best order books, right? the least amount of ships coming, which industries have the most promising demand trends. And then I dive into specifics of the companies, like what's going on with the management team, what's going on with their liquidity, Where's their debt maturities at? And I think that teamwork that we have, and I mentioned we also have an energy guy and analyst guy, I think that teamwork is what enables us to, to exceed. Got you. So basically, like shipping, it's not a very buy and hold friendly sector. You kind of have to be at it every time and looking at the analytics and see the shifts coming. It's very hard to find a company and just stay there for five, 10 years or? Yeah, I think I, I don't think five or 10 years is very reasonable unless it's a tier one, ultimately solid company. I think uh, one company that I would say maybe five or 10 years you could actually consider uh, is Euronav, for example. I mean, that's probably the best tanker name in the space. Um, I, I think I would probably still personally, you know, trade out of it as it goes up and buy more as it goes down. I'm, I'm very cyclical like that. I'm more of a uh, more of like a, I call myself like a cycle trader. You know, I, I try to buy the cycles when they're down and, and, and sell them when they're higher. I mean, that's aspirational. We never we, we never get it 100% right. But the idea is that you buy the cycle when nobody really likes it or and right when it's heating up, right? The rates are starting to turn. All the indications are starting to come up, but people are still skeptical. So it's like you've already turned the corner, you know, and, and that's that's what we like to do. We like to have the tailwinds on our back. And when things don't go our way, and I look, man, I'm wrong, uh, God, 30, 40, 50% of the time I'm wrong. But the point is that when you're wrong, you try to lose a little bit of money, you know, 10, 20, 30%. And when you're right, you got two bagger, three bagger, four bagger. So, you know, even if you're only right 40, 50% of the time, I mean, you're going to make money here. For people starting to invest in shipping, have you seen any typical blind spots? What are the usual blind spots you have in shipping? Well, the, the biggest trap that I see a lot of, especially retail investors get into, is they, you know, they buy like the lowest price stock or the highest volume stock or, you know, they get into these things like, and I don't want to just hear, sit here and name and shape stocks, but I think Castor Maritime was a recent one that got a lot of attention, uh, CTRM, and that was like a Wall Street Bets Reddit stock. And they get into these names that are very popular and they might be a fun trade for a week or two, but there's nothing there, you know, after a couple of weeks or a couple months when the trading volume goes away, you know, the company falls apart. One name that got a lot of folks in trouble was dry ships, right? I mean, dry ships got everybody in trouble. So that's just one example. I think that's a pitfall. Um, another pitfall is probably not applying the correct metrics. So in shipping, as you, I'm sure you're very well aware, uh, price to NAV is a big one. Uh, you can also look at cash flows and, and so on, but price to earnings or, you know, earnings per share or book value, 
it's not a lot of value in something like book value because that's based on historical accounting values. And if you if you're really into that, you know, you want to nerd out about the way financials work, the book value directly ties into your accounting depreciation, which ties into your earnings per share. So both those values can be distorted wildly in both directions. Definitely. So another concept I heard you talk about that I thought was fascinating was the, I mean, there's a big narrative now, especially when it comes to Bitcoin, that it's a great asset to have in this inflationary inflationary um, time. And you also said that shipping has that sort of that hedge as well, if we see more and more inflation. Can you unpack, unpack that idea a bit? Yeah, sure. I, you know, I'm not a huge, I, I don't expect hyperinflation or anything wild around the corner. So that's not necessarily a viewpoint that I have personally, but I know that a lot of folks in the market are interested in inflation hedges. So that's kind of why I brought that up. I, I think that was the lead, the webinar that I did recently. I, I mentioned that. Um, shipping the assets themselves, at the end of the day, they're commodities and they're built with, you know, steel and they transport world trade. So at the end of the day, it's it's a product, it's a commodity, it has intrinsic value. So as you expect inflation to go up and the price of steel to go up, the price to build new vessels is going to go up. The value of taking an old ship and demolishing it is going to go up. So you think about both ends of the asset curve lifting. It costs more money to build a new ship. You get more money for recycling an old one. The value of the commodities that you're transporting, the iron, the coal, the oil, that's all going up because of inflation. So the services you're providing, the dollar value of those is going up. So basically everything involved with <clears throat> the calculating the value of the ship is going up. So that's a positive for, for your asset values. Now, on the other hand, most of the better companies, not all of them, but most of the better companies have either fixed debt where it's you know fixed for four, five, six years, or they have a bank facility where it's you know LIBOR plus 200 or 250 or 300, and they've done swaps and they've locked in a lot of their interest rate costs. So if you have an inflationary environment where inflation is higher than normal, say five or 10%, the value of your debt is going to go down, like the real value of the debt, because it's you're only paying two or 3%, but each year the debt's worth less and less and less, and your assets are worth more and more and more. And so you're applying leverage from both ends. Your assets are worth more, your liabilities are worth less, and it's just a beautiful place to be. Makes makes sense. So so you said previously that you you analyze the management in shipping companies. Have you found any criteria that helps you separate the good management from the great management when you have gone through all of them? So there's a few there's a few different things to consider with management. The first one is it's kind of just alignment of interest. Does the management benefit absolutely the same way I benefit? And sadly in shipping, especially historically, the answer a lot of times has been no. There's been a lot of related party management contracts. There's been a lot of incentives for companies to want to grow their fleets. So alignment's the first, that's the absolute, the first thing we look at is alignment. Um, second of all is, is competence. <laughs> you know, how, how have these guys done in the last 10 or 15 or 20 years of timing the market? And there's a few names out there that they're always wrong or they've always, they've always messed it up and, and we won't just sit here and name and shame. But there's some other players that have almost always been the smartest people in the room. And one person I'll, I'll throw a shout out to, uh, even though the alignment not, might not always be there with her companies, is uh, Angelique Frango at, at Navios. I mean, her investment decisions in the market have always been phenomenal, at least from a personal perspective. Uh, Marinakis at Capital Maritime has been another one who's always been phenomenal. Uh, Fredrickson is, is among the better names in the, in the business. Um, so that, that second of all is competence. And then the third of all is, is kind of like, what is their track record of fairness? What have they done? Um, have they played fair? Because there's some companies that have related party structures, but they've played quite fair with them. They've been reasonable with them. Uh, one company that we've invested with recently that has related party structures that I don't necessarily like, but the management's been very fair is Denouse, a DAC, a container ship firm. Um, I, they have related party management contracts. Uh, Costa Mare, CMRE has, has related party management contracts, but both, both of those, uh, both DAC and, and CMRE have been very fair to shareholders. So there's more aspects I sp we can go into. We can talk about the balance sheet. We can talk about liquidity. But it, in terms of management, it, it's kind of those three things. What, what's their alignment? You know, what's their what's their competence? And, and what's their track record? How do you? I mean, if you look at shipping, maybe if you compare it to other like mega hype stocks like Tesla, etc., it's less um, analysis on shipping. And I think you said that in a in a previous interview that that's actually a big upside for people who really want to go dive into shipping and really understand it because then you have the asymmetry that there is an upside in actually doing 
great analysis on the shipping industry. Do you feel that that upside exists in a large extent? So if you really want to do the work and get really deep into these companies, you have the opportunity to find big upside? I think that's certainly true, uh, especially if you have the right tools, right? I think with our, our team of five um, coming to the markets, we we have those tools, we have those abilities. Um, I don't think, just to be completely honest, I don't think everybody with a notepad can can you know trip into the market and and become the next Warren Buffett. But <laughs> I think the hurdle is a lot lower in shipping. Um, I, I think um, I could put a team of fifty people together and try to attack Apple or Tesla. And I'm not confident that I could create any value whatsoever. I mean, it would just be rolling the dice. Uh, with shipping, uh, we've been able to make an enormous impact um, in, in that period of time. Um, I, I think there's probably other smaller sectors, like maybe like mining or biotech or some of those where, where there's been similar phenomenons. And, and I think that's just part of it. I mean, I think that as an investor, you have to realize where, you're, where you have an edge, where you have a good track record, and where you don't. And, you know, I focus, I mean, almost exclusively in shipping. Like I have a couple like hedges. I'm short a couple names that are really hyped. To some of these crazy like bio, um, like in, uh, electric vehicle hydrogen stocks that I'm short. But look, I mean, I spend 90, 95% of my time directly in my lane, which is shipping. And that's because I, I've, I've proven over the years, year in, year out, that I can beat the market there. I, I, I'm not confident in my ability to beat the market in, you know, ship uh biotech or or energy or something so basically you have, you have to find that that comp the circle of competence uh, that warren buffett talks about C can you talk a bit about how, how you structure your day and to to be as productive as possible look i mean as we mentioned at the start i'm a full-time phd student at this at this time so i probably couldn't keep doing this if i didn't have such a great team that does a lot of this work and, and that we've assembled over the years so that you know changes up my workload and how much time I have available. Uh, but look, I mean, it's just about staying after the latest developments and staying on top of those. And we have a proprietary analytics platform that tracks all the company specific data, all the fleet data, um, the net asset values. We update those on a weekly basis. We subscribe to all the, all the major sources in shipping. Uh, so for example, Clarkson's shipping intelligence, uh, Vessel's value. We've, we've worked with Vessel's value since uh, 2012, 2013. Uh, we've been on trade wins for over a decade. So, you know, we subscribe to all the latest sources and we have a very, very tight uh, analytics platform. So I think those two things add a lot of efficiency. I, I think when I think our team can digest a news release and come up with actionable, you know, commentary in five minutes, which might take somebody a week. So let me give you one example. Uh, we're recording on April 13th, uh, 2021 right now. Uh, yesterday morning, there was a press release that came out about Navigator Holdings. Uh, they're, a, they're an LPG firm, mid-sized LPG, and they did a merger with, uh, with Chile's fleet. Uh, I think it was called Ultra Gas, and, and they did kind of a big merger. Uh, we were able to get all the details of that merger, plug them into our analytics, update all the metrics and debt and all that sort of things. And we were, within five minutes, we were able to produce actual commentary. We're raising our fair value estimate from $12 to $13. We're taking a long position in Navigator. We did this yesterday, a disclosure on long Navigator at $9.30 yesterday. Uh, we were able to move within five minutes of getting that news. And, um, you know, I personally was a chunk of the market that morning. Just I was hoovering up every share I could find. I, I couldn't believe it. It was such a great deal. Uh, that's just one example of we could do something in five minutes that it, it might take somebody else several days or a week to get onto. Got you. So if you look at some of the stories in the shipping market today and maybe forward, are there some stories you are more excited about than others? Some you see some trends that you're really interested in following right now? Yeah, I, I think it's I think what makes me the most excited is when I see all the things turning up and looking good and the stocks haven't moved yet. So I, I think that's what makes me the most like I start drooling over the stock, right? So container ships last fall. Like the rates were on a, a spike. We were seeing, you know, back then it was like 12 month, 18 month charters, but they're very good charters. And the stocks were all in the toilet. So last fall, we were buying everything we could find. I, mean, I was along everything. Uh, I was along you know, Atlas Co, Costa Maray, Global Ship Lease, Naus, MPC. What was I not long? <laughs> I don't even, I think there's like one name I didn't like and I wasn't long. I was along everything in the space. Um, we're still long selective container ship names. 
Um, I think we're probably like fourth or fifth inning on containers, sixth inning, somewhere in there. Um, so like one of my, my favorite picks actually right now is, is, and I have to disclose it's governance risk and, and that sort of thing. So my, one of my biggest positions is Navios Partners, uh, stock symbol NMM. And that's ran by Angeliki uh, friend Grau. She's kind of the, the lead behind that. Uh, one of the best, smartest in the business, but there are some alignment and governance issues. Uh, so for example, we believe they're going to do 10 to 12 bucks in earnings this year. They're going to do 10 to 15 next year. Net asset value, we think it's about 55 now. We think it's going to be 70 or so by the summer. But even with all that said, our target, our fair value estimate is only $40 because we're applying a pretty big discount for the governance and the management. So that's, that's one name I like right now. I like it a lot. But going forward, I'm really getting more excited about dry bulk. And the reason I'm getting excited about dry bulk is that every single indicator we have is flashing like buy, buy, buy. Uh, the only thing that concerns us on dry bulk is that maybe two or three years from now, you know, coal is going to top out and, and iron ore trades might shift, but everything is flashing by and the stocks have barely moved. So, so I think, I think right now it's containers. I love the Navios. I'm buying the Navios, but I think kind of like going forward, I think dry bulk's a little bit better. Super interesting. And, and you've also been very bullish on, on the LNG market. Can you talk a bit about that? And are you still share that bullishness forward? Yeah, I think, well, I think LNG, and I mentioned this in my, my recent webinar, but that's a cyclical and a secular growth story. So shipping cyclical bull and bear markets. Se uh, secular means it's you know, going straight up for a decade or two straight. And that's what the LNG trade is doing. Uh, we really like one name in that business. Uh, it's Flex LNG. It's a Fredrickson backed firm. Um, we've interviewed the CEO several times. I think you might have as well. Uh, Washington Collect, he's uh, very active on Twitter as well. Uh, it's pretty fun to get engaged there. But it's, uh, you know, the net asset value of this company is like 13, 14 bucks, and they own all the most ultra modern assets. And the stock trades, uh, I don't even know what it trades at now, but it's like 70% or 65% of net asset value. And they own all the best assets. So I would say I'm bullish on that company. I wouldn't say the whole space writ large. I, I think you got to really look at what companies you're buying and what management teams you're working with. Definitely. So in terms of shipping for people that want to get more interested, I mean, they can read the analysis, etc. But have you read any really good books about the topic that really can be a good place to start as well? Yeah, I think it depends on how, how deep you want to get. Um, there's a really fun book that you can start with. Um, it's called Box. Um, and it's a story of container ship trades. And you can buy that I think it's on Amazon for like seven or eight bucks or something. And it's the story of how container ship trade and the, the whole business was basically invented. It was like a US truck driver. Uh, I think it was Martin McLean. I, I hope I didn't butcher that. Uh, back in like the 1950s, uh, the dude started, like bought a bunch of old ships and like welded some like metal like brackets on them and stuck some containers on there. And he invented the containerized trade. And, you know, now we talk, you know, containerized trade, a, a vessel holds anywhere from like 5,000 to 24,000 of these boxes. I think the first, <laughs> the first ship this guy made held 24 boxes or something. <laughs> so, but just a really fun read. And, and it was really cool. Um, Cause you know, I'm an American citizen and let's be honest, the Americans have lost all their edge in shipping innovation. Like I just have to, I mean, Korea, Japan, China, uh, parts of Europe uh, are so much more, you know, into the shipping technology than we are today. And so it's really cool to kind of read that story and see kind of, it actually came from, you know, the United States from a truck driver and sort of a national pride kind of, it was kind of cool. Um, the other book that's fun to read, um, there's actually like three of them. Um, they're, I, want, I don't want to mess this up. I think it's called The Shipping Man. Um, it's written by uh, Matt McCleary, the guy that does marine money in those conferences. And that's just a really fun, <laughs> you're not going to learn anything about investing from it, but you'll learn a little bit about the culture of shipping. You'll learn a little bit. So those are two very fun books. You could read each one of them in like a week. Um, though, if you want to go really technical, so both books, it's two really fun books. And then one super technical book uh, is Martin Stafford, uh, Maritime Economics. And I I have to see if it's on my desk. Uh, not next to me, but it's actually behind me in the in the bookshelf over there. So Martin Stoffords Marine Maritime Economics is, is something I keep on hand. Um, I, I studied it extensively back in like 2012, 2013 before I started getting more into this business. I mean, that's a great recommendation. Uh, there's a lot of people listening that are fairly young that would like to to have an analysis role. Uh, do you have any advice if you if you're starting out as an anal analyzing an industry and like how much you have to work to really understand it? What are some of the the habits you need to develop in order to become really good at that? Yeah, I, I think the first thing you can really do is. I mean, <laughs> to say like be cliche, but you know, like stay in school, do well at your basic financial education, 
right? I, I, I'm not saying you have to have a college degree or anything like that, but you do have to understand financial accounting, uh, managerial accounting, corporate finance, how those things work. Uh, maybe sign up for something like the CFA, you know, take a level one, take a le- I don't think you need to be a, like a, a full up, you know, CFA. Um, but like I took level one way back, um, you know, back in man, 2012, something. And that just gave me a very kind of core understanding of, of some of the basics, do stuff like that. And then, you know, put a little bit of your own money to work. You know, I, I, I hate how the analysts, I mean, I understand why for like conflicts of interest and stuff, but like none of the analysts, the official analysts own anything. Like none of them have any stakes in the game. So, and you're not going to learn as much if you don't have money in the game. If you don't know what it feels like to win, if you don't know what it feels like to lose, if you don't know what it feels like to get screwed over by a bad management team, you know, <laughs> like you're not going to learn those lessons that you have to learn in life. So those are my, those, I guess my advice would be kind of get the formalized education, <clears throat> learn some of the credentials and then start investing a little bit yourself. Um, then you can reach out and, you know, do an internship. But, you know, if you're in Europe, you know, maybe it's like Fernley's or Clarkson's or, you know, DNB or something. Um, you know, United States, we, we Jeffrey's, uh, I'm trying to think of somebody. We've lost a lot of our shipping banks in the United States, but uh, Jeffrey's is a big one. Uh, Stiefel's another one, uh, I think Evercore. So there's there's a few places where you can get internships. Um, I, I, maybe not the world's best advice, but, you know, that that's kind of how I'd structure it. Do, do you prefer that sort of skin in the game in the management as well in the shipping companies? Do you also follow that and feels it's important that they have real skin in the game, the management as well, when you go into the stocks? Absolutely. Like, I don't want to pay a guy, you know, more because he owns more ships or <clears throat> if if my CEO doubles his fleet, um, I'm not super stoked about doubling his base pay, right? Like, I, I believe you have to have enough base pay to attract good talent. And I think in the United States, that's it, it's probably higher than I'd like to see. I think some of the companies like, and I love the management team like at Seaways, but they're they're you know the pay is pretty high over there. Um, but I, I think you have to have base pay high enough to attract good talent, and then you have to have very aligned incentivized warrants and options and so on. And and some companies do it better than others. Um, I would say <clears throat> some of the European firms they don't give out as many options and warrants as I would like. I think I'd actually like to see the execs paid more. Um, I think some of, uh, I, I think the execs, the base pay is fine. I think it's fair, but I think I would actually like to see them incentivize more. I think a lot of the European peers, are, they're not paid enough, to be honest with you. Um, in, in terms of the United States peers, some companies do it better than others. Uh, some companies have very, very professional, detailed pay packages. Uh, I mentioned Seaways is one of them, very, very detailed pay package. Uh, Euronav is not an American company, but they're very detailed, very corporate governance, very strong. Um, Sometimes it can be misleading as well. If, if, if ownership interests are really high, it can get to a point where the scales tip and now you're the minority shareholder and now there can be some abusive deals. So I think sometimes you see a company and you're like, wow, the insiders own 70% of the company. <laughs> it's like, yeah, that's not quite as good as you might think it is. Um, I think something like 10% would be a lot better. Definitely it makes sense. So what are the goals going forward? Is it to continuously beat the average or do you have other goals in, in the team going forward? <laughs> Well, I mean, look, at the end of the day, uh, we sell research and shipping and we have model portfolios and stuff. So, you know, folks sign up for a service because they want to beat the market. They want to make money. So at the end of the day, I mean, that, that's kind of what matters, to be honest with you, in terms of our research product. But in terms of me personally, um, I enjoy this, you know, day in, day out. I, I love to, talking about the markets. I like uh, analyzing stocks. I like when you have good trades. Uh, there's there's like an intrinsic enjoyment to that factor. Um, it is tough when you have a year like like 2020 last year, uh, last summer, um, the first half of last year was rough. Um, we actually ended the year down uh, 6.8% on our models. And the shipping industry average was like 35% down. So we like destroyed the average in shipping, but we still lost 6.8%. And that was kind of disappointing, right? To have a negative year to lose 6.8%. And it was also kind of, you know, psychologically difficult, you know, halfway through the year, there's a lot of trolls that came out of the woodworks. <laughs> you know, it was kind of like, man, they're attacking from everywhere. And now it's like, now it's like everyone's my best friend, you know, because, you know, 2021 <laughs> has been a, been a damn good year. But so, yeah, I like, I like winning. Like, who doesn't like winning? Um, but you have to love the game. <laughs> so it's kind of corny, but. yeah. Definitely. So where can people reach out and find you and connect with you? What's the best platform to use? 
so the quickest thing is go to Twitter uh, at Mincemeyer. Uh, you know, if you can spell it and figure that one out, then you find me on Twitter. Uh, we also have research free trials available for our platform. Uh, they're going to be available. We're recording on the 13th of April. They're scheduled to close on the 15th of April. I, I might push that back a couple of days just because I know we just did this podcast. But uh, that's Mincemeyer.com is kind of the redirect, and that'll take you right to the landing page. So those are those are the two best sources. That's perfect, Jay. Thank you so much for joining. It was a pleasure to have you on. Of course, Chris. Thanks. Hi everyone, Christopher here again. Just a few things before you leave the show. If you like this episode, it would be great if you could give it a review and also share it with your professional network. If you want to get in touch with me, Twitter is the place. Just go to at Chris Wunheim. You can also find this information in the show notes. Hope to see you tune in to the next episode and take care. <laughs>